Kim, you've released a unique African wildlife book, Africa on Safari. What drove you to produce a book? Well, I'd never even been to Africa, and my wife had for 20 years tried to get me there. And then one day she said, right, I've booked the flights, we're going, you organise the ground content. I thought, okay, well, I better get excited about it. And I realised that it was great for photography, so I bought a couple of books, got really excited. We went to Kenya, had the time of our life, and I thought I took some great photos. And I was only ever going there for um, a photographic bit of fun. And I thought, well, these aren't bad photos. The last morning of the trip I saw a guy's book, Alex Berners-Sconi's Wild Africa, I thought, what am I doing? I'm hopeless compared with this guy. And I got all enthused. I thought, I'm going back for another photo safari. So eight weeks later, we were there again. Eight weeks later, we went back again. So at the end of about 14 months, we'd done six trips. And a lot of people would look at our photos because they continued to get better. And people would say, oh, I wouldn't mind buying those or you should do a book. And I thought, maybe I should do a book. And then I thought, let's just do it. And that was the moment when we committed to doing a 200-odd page book we found a publisher a little while later, and uh, the rest is history. It's out. Now, to get the images that have gone into Africa on safari, you've used some rather unique methods. Can you tell me a bit about them? Yeah, the, the remote control buggy is, is an absolute winner. It's got a 5D camera on it from Canon, and we drive it out, and we put it in place, and then animals are drawn to it. Certain animals, lions in uh, particular love it, wild dogs, some leopards, uh, elephants occasionally, but it allows us to get this unique perspective because you actually shoot up and you don't often see uh, a great shot of an animal looking from a very low angle. So it's been the most marvellous thing. It's um, unconventional. It's good fun. No animals ever get hurt. We only ever do it on uh, mainly private conservancies with the, our guide's permission. But the end result shots, I love them. And what about the quadcopter? Used it a few times. Some countries have actually banned them. Uh, we mainly use that for aerial photography of landscapes. But a couple of times we put it uh, within the vicinity of large herds of elephant or near uh, giraffes. They're interested, but at some point they just think they'll no, turn around and walk away. And some of the images, they're taken from quite low down, it seems. How do you get those? We've actually buried cameras in the ground, particularly at water holes, where you put it just above, above the water line. Elephants come down and drink in the heat of the day, and you get this marvellous shot just above the water line. Occasionally the water, because it's in a waterproof housing, the water laps up over the, the lens, so you get this line of water. It's like, almost like an underwater shot. But, yeah, they're unusual. Uh, and occasionally we lose cameras. We've had a couple of times where we put cameras low down for lions and one male lion just came up and put his teeth right through the back of the camera. It still worked. You just couldn't see the pics because the screen was broken. And a couple of times uh, we've actually had lions take off with our buggy. But they only ever take it for a few minutes. They realise that uh, they can't eat it and it doesn't threaten them. They get bored and leave it there. Then we go and pick it up and wipe the slobber off it. So your book's a joint effort with your wife, Tonya, who's also a very talented photographer, who's got the most pictures in the book. Me, mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you it would have taken me years to get all the photos that we've got together. Uh, in particular, if you look at the, the buggy shots, I drive the buggy and I operate the camera that's on top of the buggy. But to get the behind the scenes shots, you have to have a second person. And Tonya loves that 300mm lens and we always get great shots of what's going on. And I think that's what people like because uh, they get to see what's actually transpired to get those shots from the camera on the ground and from behind the scenes. But there would be probably about 40 shots in there that are true team efforts. One in particular, I had to hold a monopod down and I physically couldn't hold the um, clicker because it's got a remote clicker. Tonya clicks the shutter, I hold the monopod, we get this amazing shot of a lion pouring at our camera and those shots are just rare. Have you ever been in any danger? Look, I think you're always in danger out there because you don't know what these animals are going to do. I've had a, a lion charge me and at the same time Tonya on foot. Uh, it was a female lion and we'd followed it in mana pools in, um, in Zimbabwe. And we thought we were safe and our guide said, look, you're fine there, just take photos. If the thing charges at you, don't stop taking photos. Well, this thing got very cranky and it roared at us and it came at such speed kicking up dust and we weren't quite ready for it. In the past we've had a couple of instances where we sort of expected it would happen but this thing came at us and it was blood in its mouth and uh, thankfully it stopped 15 metres from us. But I was fine because Tonya was in front of me so if it took anyone she was getting done first. What are your most vivid memories of your safaris? I do remember 
watching Tonya lie down in front of an elephant in Zimbabwe on our last trip. She was seven metres from this animal. It's a wild animal. It's unpredictable. But the guides are experts in animal behaviour. And they will tell you, don't do that, do that. This stage, they said, Tonya, you can go out there and lie down. Keep low, take ground level shots. Kim, you can go with her. I don't, don't want to go with her. No, no, you can go out there. Happy to let her go out there and do it. So I stood behind uh, a fairly healthy tree trunk and I just couldn't believe that she was lying in front of this animal and was unperturbed by it, as was the animal unperturbed by Tonya. Now, there are thousands of wildlife photographers and almost all of them would kill to have their work in National Geographic. How did you manage to get their attention? I'd like to say I did a bit of work on that, but our publisher in the UK took a mock-up of the book in October 2014 to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and she presented that to all the buyers from around the world. And she came back and she said, oh, we've had some good bites from Germany and Japan. And I didn't know what that meant. And two months later, she said, look, no go on the Japan, but National Geographic could pick the book up for a German language version. And I could not believe it. I had to ask it, the, the real National Geographic or is this some offshoot? No, no, it's the real National Geographic. And so when we got the book, uh, which I happen to have just here, and you see down here the National Geographic logo, the German language version, it was a, an amazing thing to see this come to fruition. So, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. We both are. Now, I've heard that life on safari isn't as glamorous as it sounds. Can you tell me about your typical day on safari? Typical day? Uh, up at five o'clock, get all the camera gear ready, in the car at six, travel 200 kilometres sometimes in dusty, bumpy roads, some of the worst roads in the world. Uh, come back at about midday after you've had a, probably a 15-minute breakfast out there. Hopefully you've taken an award-winning shot. We have a quick shower at lunchtime, lunch, lunch couple of hours of photo editing, maybe a snooze, three o'clock back in the car for another four hours, back at about seven o'clock, download the photos, grade them all, have a quick dinner, have a shower, go to bed, times by 20 or 30 days in a row. It sounds great when you look at a lot of what the tourists do, which is sundowners and very casual sort of things and very social, but we're not out there to, to do the tourist thing. We're out there to get the photos and quite frankly, you just have to be out there for 10 to 12 hours a day. It sounds quite gruelling. What keeps you going? You never know what's going to happen. I, I can't think that you know, the photo over my shoulder here, am I going to get that photo today? I didn't think I was going to get that photo that day. Impala running across a runway as a, a light aircraft's taking off. Who could even think of that? Lions killing different animals, animal on animal. It's, it, you just never know what you're going to get, and that's what brings everybody back. What are your favourite camps? I like Kiba Point in Tanzania in the Salu area. You get the whole four, uh, four tents to yourself, so if you've got a big group or a small group, you've got four tents, it's on the river, and uh, it has the most marvellous wild dog action. They're very hard to find, and not many in the world. Great spot. Mara Explorer in Kenya in the Masai Mara is a down-to-earth camp, but you drive out of that gate and you've got action everywhere, left, right. It's just so easy and it's beautiful open plains, so for photography, it's sensational. And if you're after real glamour, you'd go to Tanzania to the Ngorogoro Crater. Uh, the Crater Lodge is unlike anything you've ever seen. It's very oldie world, uh, hellishly expensive and very comfortable. Where are you off to next? Chad in Central Africa. It's dangerous. There's the Boko Haram on the, on the borders, but we're going to land straight into the uh, main airport and fly straight out to Zakuma National Park. And there you see elephant herds between four and 500, and they're tightly bunched. They do that as a protection mechanism because they've been hunted savagely for, for decades. And there are very few places that you can get to see that many elephants in the one spot. So we'll be doing a lot of light plane charter work, overflying them and uh, dawn and dusk flights. So I'm quite excited about that. Now, it's probably like picking your favourite child, but what's your favourite animal to photograph? Leopard. Mm -hmm. It's such a sexy animal. It's so cool and graceful in the way it moves. Its colours are nice and they're hard to find. I remember we had uh, a trip in Botswana. We were at Zarafa camp and we had five hours on our own with the leopard. We followed it, we watched it hunt, it missed every time. It went up in a tree, it slept, it came down. And to me, it is uh, just a 
it's, it reminds me of Brian Ferry. Brian Ferry, <laughs> very cool guy. This is the Brian Ferry of the animal world. Now, I've heard that you may have uh, come close to leaving part of your foot over in Africa at one stage. Can you tell me a bit more about that? We went to Rwanda to photograph gorillas, and there's quite a healthy hike to find these things. It can take up to four hours to get there, an hour with them, and four hours back. And I'd gone away from Perth with this sore on my foot. And as we were away, it started to get worse, and, and it was nearly turning septicemic on me. But I still plowed on. I was wearing these rubber galoshes, and this thing was nasty. It looked terrible and it hurt like all hell. But I thought, I've gone that far. I may as well do the two walks. But straight away after I'd done the second walk, we're straight back to Kigali Hospital. And uh, for seven US dollars, they fixed it. <laughs> now, was there any point during your travels when you thought, I'm pushing it now? I, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this situation. Yeah, I was uh, in Mana Pools on foot with an elephant. And somehow I got uh, split between, um, there was an elephant between me and our guide. And I was on my own in this V of a tree and I thought, oh, that's all right because that thing's going towards the guide. But then the elephant stopped and turned around and started walking back towards me. And I'm gesturing to my guide, what should I do? I'll be the first to admit I'm not terribly au fait with what these animals do on a one-on-one -on -one situation. So he gestured to me I had to get low and I had to very gently and smoothly walk across to another tree. And I could see it looking at me and I just kept low and I thought, well, I just got to hope because really if it comes after me, I've got no mechanism for defence. Now, your work is obviously quite unique in terms of the strategies that you'd use to get your photographs and how close you're getting to the animals. Has this ever ruffled any feathers in photography circles? Uh, not that I know of, but then perhaps they're not likely to bring it up with me. But certainly there'd be people who think it's not right, you shouldn't use the buggy or you shouldn't bury cameras, but... Uh, I just get back to the fact that you have to get your guide's permission. You have to get the, the conservancy owner's permission. No animal ever gets uh, frightened by the thing. Uh, most of the time you put the camera on the ground with the buggy and you let the animal come to it. That's, what, that's how it works. If you, if you try and chase an animal, it'll just go away. It, it won't stand for it. And in terms of the future of African tourism, let's say, how important do you think is, is work like yours in, te in terms of telling the story of Africa you know, to other people who might never experience it? I think what we do is we, we get people excited about what's on offer and hopefully it inspires people to go and visit because it's only with Western tourism that these areas will stay afloat because it, it takes a lot of money to go there and you're injecting that money to keep that area alive for those animals because uh, if the hunters pay more, they'll end up shooting all these animals. So it's very vital that we bring to the fore tourism as a great way of keeping these animals alive for us to see because you don't want to see them end up in a zoo. Um, and certainly a lot of the feedback we get is, yeah, this is great, we want to go there, we're planning it. It's our number one thing to do when we retire. And tips? for a first timer? Go somewhere that's comfortable. You wouldn't go to Katavi National Park where it's very hot in October. Admittedly, you get amazing sights of thousands of hippos in a pool, but you will have lots of bugs in your bed. You will have uh, hot temperatures and very bumpy roads. So somewhere like the Masai Mara, perfect. It's very comfortable. It's safe. A lot of people think, oh, it's Kenya, there's dramas. But once you get in the Mara, it's a national park. So uh, I'd be suggesting the Maasai Mara or somewhere in the Serengeti, but uh, my preference for a first time would definitely be the Mara. Mm -hmm. And what type of equipment would someone need to take with them? Lots of drugs, just in case you, you get caught up because it's very hard to get some stuff over there that uh, if you need it in a hurry. But really, you just take a camera. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting on an iPod, uh, an iPhone or um, a Canon 500mm lens, but um, you'll always come away with memories and they'll be your memories. Uh, what else should you take? You can't take too much, so you, we're limited to 15 kilos of soft pack luggage, unless you pay for a freight seat, uh, which we do, it allows us to take probably 100 kilos of stuff. And when we go away, you won't believe the stuff that we take away. There's, there's nothing that we are faced with that we can't get a shot. And if you could make sure that your readers take one you know, lasting moment from the book, what are you really wanting people to take away from Africa on safari? How beautiful these animals are. And you see them 
in sharp images on glossy paper and you just have this absolute yearning, I think, to think, I want to go and see that in real life. And sometimes, I've got to be honest, I look at photos and I think, that looks better than what I saw on the day. And I, uh, there's one particular photo in there of a hippo sitting up and Tonya was taking this shot and I thought, what are you worried about? That's a, that's a lousy photo. But when we saw it on paper and on the screen, it just came alive and uh, I love that photo. Well, Kim, Africa on safari is absolutely stunning. I think you and Tonya should be very proud of yourselves and I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks, Sophie. <laughs>